Okay, the very first guest of the podcast, Confident Performance. So pleased to have him on the show today, Mr. Nathan Hughesberry, UK-born, Toronto-based filmmaker, writer, director, and his films have been screened in over 50 film festivals worldwide. He is alumni of Berlinale Talents, and he has completed a master's degree in screenwriting at Central St. Martins. So, without further ado, here we go. So, first of all, I wanted to just talk to you about, like, what is the, you know, the creative process to you as a person? Um, I think it's, I think it's about coming to terms with yourself, you know? I, I think that's what I, however it works for people and whatever kind of rituals they have and whatever kind of physical process it is, I think it's always just you sitting down with yourself and trying to kind of <laughs> defeat yourself or work with yourself in order to kind of produce this thing. Um, and I, I never really know kind of what I want to do. I mean, I spent the first kind of five or six years working with someone else who would just say, this is the idea, this is what we're going to do. Um, so then my job was more simple because it was just like, how do I, how do I realize this practically? Whereas now I think it's kind of, it didn't feel satisfying. So I wanted to kind of create my own ideas, but it's much more difficult because you, you start from nothing and go, you know, what do I care about? And, you know, what do I want to say? And then at the same time, actually just kind of ignoring that and just saying what actually needs to, to come out. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll return actually back to that, uh, that idea of, finding out what you like care about um mm -hmm. but uh you said you said they're like defeating yourself what do you mean by that like so you, yeah uh, you, correct. you're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with yourself in the ring like, i know you like boxing right you've been you've been boxing recently but do you see it as like a boxing match the creative project? i used to, i think i used to see it as a, a big fight where it's like that's it you know like it's so hard and like you have to drag yourself up and, oh i don't want to do it you know kind of beating yourself into this thing and getting work out and i think because it wasn't productive in that sense i mean even if you create something you're so you're so destroyed by it that it doesn't even feel good you know um and i actually watched something very recently where a woman was talking about that being a very kind of like typical male thing of like it has to be you kind of diving into a burning building to rescue something. And she said it actually doesn't have to be like that. It can just be you kind of moving with this thing. Um, so, you know, more of a dance or more of a partnership where it pulls you somewhere. <laughs> My dad's like, dancing! <laughs> <laughs> Boxing stuff! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's that thing where you feel pulled by something. You go, okay, well, okay, what if the character did this then? And you follow it, and if it works, mm -hmm. it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And you, you put it in. I think much more, even as we've worked together on this project, where it's like um, just trusting things and following a line um, and seeing if it works. You know, you saying, "Oh, what if? Well, what if he did this actually?" And I say, "Yeah, that kind of that makes sense. He could do that. Let's see." You know, mm -hmm. and I yeah. think just make it much easier. I think we we value it being really difficult because it feels more rewarding somehow if you've tortured yourself or you know that whole image of the, the tortured artist is kind of mm -hmm. very yeah. attractive you know it's so difficult to to write <laughs> you know. do you think, yeah, do you think that, is, that that's a real like ma uh, battle in your your own brain you don't think that the tortured artist I even exists um i think it i think it's within yourself yeah i mean i think obviously there's there's external factors like you know money and um external success but i think deep down that that thing of feeling tortured i mean it also maybe comes back to the conversation we had last time about um you know building up that debt of oh yeah the artistic debt yeah that's that's huge maybe, right maybe that comes from that where it's like oh i know deep down that i'm not giving my all but that's something else because that's about um, not being honest with yourself and not kind of working hard as opposed to 
um, oh, I have to suffer in order to create something good, you know, which I don't think you do. I think you just got to work, work hard <laughs> and be honest with yourself. You know? do, you, do you think so? Do you think it requires like actual hard work to, to get stuff done? Or do you, think, um, do you think that some people can just naturally kind of not do anything at all and then just fall into it? Like, maybe, yeah. but yeah, I, I think maybe. I think those people, and obviously I don't know because I can only really kind of go off my own thing, but even for myself, if I seem like I'm not working or even if I'm saying to myself I'm not really, you know, I'm not at the computer writing or I'm not, you know, planning a production, that in my head I'm still taking things in and shaping it and working it. So by the time I come and sit down, something that I'd say, oh, yeah, it took me, you know, four hours to write this thing. It's, it's probably actually been, you know, three weeks of just kind of mm. thoughts coming up and going, oh, what about? And like the other day I did this 20 minute horrible workout. <laughs> like by the end of it, I was just lying on the mat and then it just, ideas started to come and I, oh, fucking hell. I really? <laughs> pulled myself up and went downstairs and thought, okay, I've got to, I've got to get this down now. Cause interesting. You know, otherwise I won't. I know that I'm, you know, mm -hmm. I know that I'm, lazy and actually that i had a romanian professor over here in toronto and i went to meet with her and i said look you know i, I just can't you know i can't get anything down i can't write anything that's of any good and you know and i feel like i'm just kind of lazy i'm not getting anywhere and she was like we're all lazy darling we're all mm -hmm. lazy mm -hmm. like once you accept that then you can work in it it it's kind of stuff that's pretty profound you know because um <laughs> You know, I, I can. I was reading something recently about laziness, and this idea that laziness doesn't exist. It's just that you you don't know something. Mm. You know, so it's like when you don't know, you don't know, right? And so then the kind of the ego comes in, and it gets perceptionally like lazy because it either it doesn't know something, and as a result, it doesn't want to like work hard. It doesn't want to fail. You know, because it's like that kind of preservation thing. So rather than going and, and looking and finding it out, it's like that pleasure pain concept, you know, how a lot of people struggle to to actually get things done. But as soon as they start to do it, they get it done. And yeah, the idea is to trick yourself into doing something so that your brain will then shift from the pain side into pleasure. Now, if you think about that and apply it to this whole notion of laziness, it's like, it makes sense, right? That you wouldn't know something and that's what would make you lazy. Yeah, you don't want to approach it because it feels dangerous or threat. Yeah, and, and it's like the learning process, you know, people find the learning process incredibly stressful. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I, so many thoughts come up when you talk about that, that I think, why are we so inherently designed <laughs> for comfort, you know? Yeah. It, not even survival necessarily, but now it's just, I think, evolved to, to just be comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm incredibly guilty, but if I have a day where, you know, say I get up and I eat breakfast and I read a book and I go for a walk and, you know, I watch some football and... I don't really do anything of any kind of note, and it feels really good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like part of me feels like, oh, that's so lovely, and then then this kind of thing sets in. It's like, oh no, you know, I can't can't live life like that, you know. Right. Do things. But I think there is this huge part of us that wants to to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. Do you um, do you do that then as part of your creative process? Would you would you do something like that and then? just go for a walk or what have you until the ideas just flow through you or or would you just yeah. decide like would you block it out in your week like i'm gonna take i'm I, i've been like hitting it hard next uh, next thursday i'm gonna do nothing for a day no no i don't and, and the thing is is that i usually wake up and try and figure out what you're um, gonna do okay that day? yeah like oh how do i feel and then like this morning, I woke up and was like, oh, I, you know, I'm so tired. And I actually just told myself not to think about it. Mm -hmm. And I started to do a bit of reading and moved around the house a bit. And then I just sat down and started writing and was like, oh, okay, good. And it just kind of, then I'm in it. And it's almost like what you're saying about tricking your brain, that part of that trick can just be like, don't think. Just, you know, you stay over there we don't need to plan the day and then suddenly you find yourself in it and you go, actually, this is quite nice now. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think for me, if I build up all this pressure where it's like, 
Um, and I used to when I was young, like today I have to write from nine till five, um, no matter what. And, and you sit there and it's like, there's so much pressure on yourself, you know, to, to create something and to stick at it. Mm -hmm. Whereas now I think I'm going to write um, and I'll feel like a sense of when I've kind of done enough and then I'll step away. You know? Right. Yeah. I was reading recently how uh, Picasso would, would kind of, would practice from, from nine to five, but he would like, you know, do a, a three hour block of like oil painting and then he would shift to watercolors and we, we've hardly seen any of his work, you know? Until, he, you know, yeah, exactly. Until it got to a point where you could just do a little scribble on a piece of paper and then sell that scribble for whatever, a hundred thousand or something. Do you know what I mean? But that's like a, a like a master, right? It's about like, yeah. mastering, mastering your skills. Um, hmm. well, I was going to say, did you see they release those kind of pie charts of like, um, you know, famous minds and how their day goes? And I think the, the no, funny thing is this. that... It was this. so different. So like Darwin, I can't, you know, Darwin like got up early or something and started working and he was very like strict. Then someone like Mozart, it was like, he gets up when he wants, works like crazy and then he <laughs> blocks out three hours of lovemaking like in the evening and just fooling around with Constanza, you know. And I thought it was great because that's just like, everyone I think has a different inner um, clock, you know, of when you can do stuff and when you feel kind of, creative and I, I don't think it's about kind of sitting around waiting for inspiration i think that's kind of nonsense but i think it's about recognizing when you're not in a space to to create and just waiting and doing something else and coming back mm -hmm. oh we we uh we've lost you a second hold on oh yeah yeah say again yeah that i think it's not about waiting for inspiration but mm -hmm. it's about recognizing when you you need to just step away mm -hmm. and, and just say okay i can't I can't create at the moment, you know, as much as anything, you might say, oh, you know, I've been running every day this week. I, I'm not going to do a run because my leg hurts. You know, why oh, would yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why would you force it? Yeah. I mean, it, it's kind of an interesting kind of concept, isn't it? Because, you know, you touch there on kind of processes for different people. Um, and I guess like some people can have those brain waves. Uh, I think there's Dr. Dre has spoken about kind of being stuck in his flow for like uh, 70, uh, 72 hours wow. and, and he just didn't go to sleep. He didn't want to, he didn't want to sleep. He just wanted to plow through it. Now, obviously we don't know, you know, whatever to keep you going in that process or whether it was literally just his creative flow, because I've been in that state before. I've been in that state where you are so juiced up on what you're doing. Time goes by really fast, but also the ideas are just like pew, 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 pew. You're just chasing it and chasing yeah, it. Yeah, right. Uh, and he described kind of not wanting to go to sleep for fear that he would wake up and he would be out of that flow state. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know it's kind yeah, of interesting. It's like, um, it's like Kerouac, isn't it, with the on the road, you know? Mm. Whether it's true or not, it, you know, it's probably blown out of proportion, but I'm, I'm sure at its core it's true that, you know, you just write and write and write and write. And, and I think it's kind of um, part of that process is about escaping the inner critic in a sense that you're, you're outrunning it, you know, that right. you're not giving yourself time to set on yourself and go, oh, hang on a minute, like, should we write here or should we write, you know, should we change that word and this word and you're just kind of going and producing and not worrying about that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's like that kind of similarly, the, the Burroughs thing where he only, was it naked lunch? Was it where he just had, he could only, he could only write it on one slither of paper. Is that, is that the thing? Is it cause he's in the mental Institute or something and, and it only, the typewriter only had one slither of paper. So he had to like chop it up and, and put it all like on the walls of the walls of the, oh um, uh, you know, of the, the cell, as it were. There's also the idea of uh, Shantaram, where he, 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 yeah. su he supposedly wrote that three times or something. That's the third. Yeah. Yeah, 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 they destroyed it twice before they found it, didn't they, in his cell or whatever, and they, they destroyed it twice, and then we see the third version, as it were, kind of forced. It's probably the best. Yeah, Do you know, forced probably... creation, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But look, let's move on a little bit here. Um, something that I kind of noticed in, in your body of work today, whether it be kind of directing or, or writing, um, you seem to 
enjoy uh, focusing or looking at uh, taboo subjects. How how do you find that in terms of kind of how do you approach that as a, a filmmaker, and how how do you get kind of comfortable with yourself when you're creating that kind of work? Because some of it is quite like it's a bit risque, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, part of that obviously goes to, you know, having worked with Madeline, who was driving a lot of those ideas. Um, so I think uh, most of that taboo stuff was kind of coming from her and wanting to push push the boundary on it. Um, and I think it's too far. I mean, I think for me, it's like always when I get something, I just look at what what's the actor going to do and what's the, what's the character in it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and anything else I just see as a kind of a backdrop anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's like, can an actor do something with this? Is this a real person? Um, you know, and the situation is kind of not irrelevant, but it's just an external set of circumstances. So I think ultimately it's the role of the artist to kind of, to do that to a degree. I mean, I, I'm always skeptical how much, it can kind of change something uh, you know i think too i i go and see something um and it it, it affects me mm -hmm. and then i go home and it's kind of like it just kind of drifts out yeah, of the it's next kind of di dilutes yeah i don't there's no call to action where i go oh you know and now i need to do this mm -hmm. i just go oh yeah the you know the planet's <laughs> burning oh well <laughs> i'm gonna make some post. you know it's not mm -hmm. I think there's not that impetus, but I think if, you know, I just saw something with Penta where he's just talking about um, just like at least criticizing stuff so that, you know, at least pointing it out and saying, you know, look, this is still going on and look, it's, you know, but it's tough because we're so kind of ingrained in that, you know, we were brought up in that, in that world, you know, that I think it feels impossible to change it, you know, so I think we just stop at some point and, now maybe more than ever kind of break off into our individual kind of you know lives and aspirations and yes. goals. yeah it's kind of it's a funny one really isn't it because you have these instances where people kind of court the media to get whatever they want in that particular you know in their particular vision of their life as it were they court the media and then the same media that they courted turns on them particularly in british media it's inevitable you know that the, the the british media loves to do that i think the american media seems to be slightly different in that respect where their kind of their celebrities are equivalently like their royal family that's how i that's how i perceive it because they don't have one themselves right so as a result you don't really tend to tear down a royal family or at least they they would never even dream of doing that our, our media is slightly different but um yeah where was i going with that um it kind of it, it's yeah it's one of those interesting things of like can, cancel culture appears you know there's there's been quite a few people this year that have been literally like cancelled uh, have you heard about that yeah yeah what, what do you think what's your thoughts on that cancel cancel culture in general I don't, I think it's just all, I think all of it's kind of just a symptom of like, um, us feeling like there's no place for us, you know, mm -hmm. anymore. And I think people feel very alienated and I think from each other and from just like, you know, I think we talked about this a while ago that when our parents were young, it was, it, there was a structure, you know, mm -hmm. and albeit it changed depending on what, you know, what your background was, but there was a kind of thing of you grow up, you make friends with the people that live near you and next door and at work and you do your job, you have your house, blah, 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 you have kids. Um, and I think that's kind of just exploded completely now. And I think we grew up in a, in a time where everything was um, panic and the destruction of everything. You know, we, mm. oh, um, I mean, even look at the plane flying into the towers, that image of when we were young, seeing that. Mm, that, you know, yeah, that shocking. Mm -hmm. Crazy. And I think our whole um, generation has had this series of, this can't happen, but it's happening and we're seeing it happen. You know? mm -hmm. How can shops be closed because of a 
<laughs> virus yeah, and it's right. happening yeah right silent silent enemy as it were yeah so, so i think it's you know we're stuck in that kind of mold of you know how do we how do we live our lives and go forward when kind of what we've been told is important actually just you know isn't important at mm -hmm. all. so do you think that's why your work uh, kind of it seems like you you kind of enjoy unnerving your audience yeah i mean i think i used to Mm -hmm. But I, I, at the same time, to be honest, I don't think I enjoyed it because I, I felt uncomfortable as well. And I mm -hmm. think, you know, we talked about, you know, going to festival screenings and I would see my film and, oh, you know, I can't, I can't watch it. And then I remember at one in Germany, people saying, you know, oh, you know, it's so cool. And I'm talking about, you know, feminism with me. And I just felt very like, I felt kind of like an imposter because it's like, Yes, I you know I believe in feminism. I believe in those ideas, but I that's not um, it's not at the core of my being. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I felt like I wasn't exposing something. I didn't feel vulnerable enough, and, I, and then I felt kind of guilty about that. So I, I almost felt like um, unnerving people and shocking people wasn't the scariest thing to do for me. Oh, and I think and now interesting. What's kind of developing is the scariest thing for me to do is um actually open up actually like the scariest thing i ever did was admit to a friend that you know I, oh, i've had struggles with depression you know mm -hmm. and, and i was terrified like i was like oh, i can't say this it's so shameful um and that was scary and mm -hmm. kind of presenting a film that you know mm -hmm. that shocked people interesting so yeah i mean that brings us quite nicely on to um your your latest piece of work uh called the irish war which you're you're kind of moving and you want to is it you want to turn this this short into a feature is that is that kind of um, all, is it on those themes that are in that are inside that, the, that short it's the same theme so i think when um when i stopped working with madeline i kind of went away and said um you know what do i want to make and do i have anything to say and you know is it worth writing? You know, what, what, what am I made of? What's in me? Um, and I think for about two years, I just wrote and wrote and wrote. Um, and things started to take shape around this theme of just, of not knowing yourself and of not, not kind of being truthful in yourself and not, not having a, a grasp of your own life. You know, I think everything's kind of around that. And, and this is that, you know, this is a guy who's gone back to meet his ex. Why? You know, they, what does he want? Yeah, what's he want to get from that? Yeah, why, why would anybody, anybody want to do that? But then everybody yeah. wants to do that too. I know. <laughs> right, we want to go back and have that final word, but we don't because then they get their final word as well. I know. You feel awful. And I think what's interesting is, you know, from my own experience of, of doing that, you know, I, I went to meet my ex, we had a conversation, and I left, and I thought, you know, what am I doing? You know, and it, it's very conflicting. You know, am I still attracted to this person? Do I want to still be with them? And you know, I don't think it's that. And even with this script, I thought, you know, what does he want? Is it that he's trying to kind of show that he's better without her? But it's not really that. And I think that the closest I could come to is it's just that part of like, if you love someone that much, that you can't just switch it off and that's it. You know. So even mm. if you get to a point where you, you don't want to be with someone anymore, you don't want to necessarily be part of their life, I think there's still this kind of residual feeling that exists that you just think it's bizarre not to ever see them again, you know, mm -hmm. or to hear about them. So do you um, think you, you can never fall out of love with somebody? Um, it, it depends on the definition of love. Because mm -hmm. I, I think in terms of... You, you can for sure, you know, hate people and, and that's very close to love as well. But I think when you form a connection that strong with someone, it doesn't, it doesn't sever entirely. I think there's still part of you and how you disguise that, you know, whether people, I have people that are like, oh, I hate my ex and da 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 da. And it's like, that's a lot of feeling, you know? Yeah, yeah. So right. that's, yeah. That's yeah, I always, um, think, I always think that the, the word hate is, is, it, it's pr it's a pretty big word, especially to use it against people that you've at one point shared a really strong and genuine connection with. You know, like people say, you know, about kind of people that you went to school with or whatever, you know, uh, siblings, uh, loved ones, family members, you know, that they hate them. You know, yeah. I, I, 
it's it, that that can that word goes deep you know i mean you can hate you can hate kind of these very serious uh ideas that people uh promote in our daily lives you know like racism and you know homophobia or what have you you know the, the, oh, list, the list goes on it's a pretty it's a pretty long list we won't go into it but you know you can hate something like that but yeah to kind of hate an ex i know uh, I mean, and, and I, I think it's an inverted um self-loathing you know? yeah and i think it's just that you know maybe you hate uh you know the way you were in that relationship or right. you, you hate you hate the relationship maybe you know maybe you hated the way it ended but yeah i think to put it on a person is very bizarre and, and i i maintain i think it's usually just from my experience of you know i hate this person and then realizing it's like oh i, I hate this aspect of myself that's yeah that's being shown in this person you know yeah. or um or i hate how vulnerable i was and that it was you know taken advantage of or, or whatever it is or yeah. i hate how i behave yeah i mean as well something that always kind of highlights to me in those kind of relationships and when you break apart or whatever and why people take so long to break it break it off is they they kind of i feel like they they hate themselves because they know that this person would have been an amazing friend to them yeah it would have been like the best friendship ever but they decided to go further than that and you know kind of consummate the friendship for want of a better word right and they they get in that relationship and then their actions of they've messed it up and as a result not only have they lost a lover or a, a husband a wife or what have you a partner uh they've lost a friend do you know what i mean like they that that friendship is gone because even if they got it back you know, and it's a friendship, there's still that, there's always, you know, that person now moves on. They get a new partner. They introduce you to that partner. Now there's friction, you know, or there isn't, or there is, or there isn't, right? It's yeah. like, it's kind of that minefield now that you have. Yeah, it's completely changed. I think actually a realization I had yesterday walking home, I don't know what I was thinking about. And I was thinking, oh, you know, I feel like I haven't been very present, like in my life and even in my relationship now. And this thought just occurred to me where I just clicked and I was like, but I am in my life now. I was like, so just change it right now. And yeah, I did, yeah. I just went home and had a conversation and was open, but it, I think that comes with age. I think when you're young, it feels very like, like, I don't know, like something is fucked up and that's it, mm -hmm. you know, and then it's over. And I think as you get older, it's like, you know, things, Firstly, you have to accept that certain things you have to let go of, you know, friendships, relationships will just leave, you know, and, and I had so many friendships that just end because it's just, I don't see them, you know, in yeah, person. I mean, there's, and then there's that saying, dissolve. isn't there, reasons, reasons, seasons, and a lifetime. Friends are here yeah. for reasons, seasons, and a lifetime. That's, that's it's one that. of those three. So, yeah. you know, I wouldn't beat yourself up too much about that because that's not always on you, right? Sometimes... I'm a believer that, that the universe presents these opportunities to people. Exactly. And then you've learned something and you move on or, or, you know, they have it. But I think as you get older, you do just realize, I think, the, the kind of power you have, I think, within yourself to go, well, you know, what am I unhappy about right now and what can I do about it? And, you know, sometimes it's nothing. Mm -hmm. you know? Sometimes it's something you can't change, so you have to let it go. But, you know, if it's like, oh, you know, I, I don't feel happy because I wasn't nice to this person, then I can just go and apologize. You know, it can, it can shift, it can change. And I, I think it's not as final as it, you know, as it felt when we yeah, were young. Maybe. Yeah. As you kind of make it, as you build it up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, when you're very young, you know, oh, they said this to me, that's it. <laughs> Never speaking to them. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, the amount of times, I mean, kids being kids, you know, um, the amount of times I kind of got into say arguments or whatever with, with their uh, friends, you know, as a youngster, and then all of a sudden you're the one that doesn't get let on the bus to go on that special trip that their parents has, you know, it's all forgiven, but oh no, you can't come on the bus, there's no room for you. Now, I had that happen <laughs> a couple of times, it's kind of crazy. But, um, <laughs> but, but less on that, but more on, um, do you think that, do you think you said you discovered this while taking a walk and we just, we kind of touched on the idea of taking time out of your week to, immerse yourself in the world around you 
so that in so being is a, a form of your creation process do you do you think that the creative process enables you to make those discoveries about your life or do you think it's more just a part of kind of getting older um it's hard to say probably a bit of both i i think my mind is quite analytical in that sense and i mean that can also be my my biggest weakness mm -hmm. and my downfall i feel like i'm always searching for an answer to something mm -hmm. um and i think i found it and then and it, it can be as banal as a friend said oh i do cold showers oh cold showers yeah that's the answer yeah, i do right, it right. or well, i'm not any happier you know um right. it's part of look i mean i think being creative is kind of this thing where you feel like um unfulfilled in your everyday life i think you feel like there's certain things you can't communicate and certain things you can't open up about and can't express and can't even go to in your own head and i think all the creative process is is you trying to get that out in a form that makes sense to other people um so i think probably the thoughts you'd have you'd have um that you'd probably feel more um indebted you know to think of your term of building up the creative debt if you weren't expressing any of it i think it would just build and build and build and build and mm. you know i've been to that point and you go okay i've got to flush this out somehow now um, and, and do you flush it out by getting just getting stuff out just getting stuff out on paper not caring about whether it's good or bad or uh, yeah. It, yeah yeah interesting i mean i i say yes but i mean as much as possible i think i'm very hard on myself so i mm. i try and then you know then i'll look back at it and go yeah i think that's okay though Pers personally i feel like you know it's all right to just write for the sake of writing just to get it on to get it on paper like sometimes i've i've been in the shower or whatever and I, incidentally i i'll uh, rather than a cold shower i'll use um i'll use a nail bed so I'll, oh. I'll I'll lie on a on a nail bed. I find that really relaxing. I can like lie, lie on that for like forty five minutes. That's the answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the answer. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But um, yeah, to kind of go back on on some of the things. Yeah, so um, you know, particularly in um, you know, in, in the Irish War, you and there's also kind of rip off is a little bit like this too. Uh, and it just seems to kind of run through a lot of your written projects where, you know, your work has a focus around kind of control and the loss of it and kind of wishing that you achieve more in your life and essentially feeling like you deserve more for your life. Mm -hmm. You know, the characters, at least. Do you find that yeah. this is a particular like challenging area in your own life or is it just, you know, is it for some other reason? that you like to no, create, I, create around those issues. No, I think that's exactly what I what I'm feeling and then I think it's trying to kind of express that through characters and I, I mean, you know, a lot of it's based on stuff that happens and you know, I've got another script that's entirely based on something that happened to me where a guy goes to spend a weekend with another woman essentially to figure out if he should be with her or stay with the woman he's with. Mm -hmm. Um but it always comes down to, yeah, that thing of, you know, I, I, I'm not good enough. I don't feel like I'm good enough. And the, I think the battle between the real self and ego, where ego is like, because, you know, if you think to say to yourself you're not good enough, there's got to be something in there that has a measure of what good enough is. So if you removed that measure, it wouldn't matter. You know, you just exist. Whether you're good enough or not it doesn't become an issue because you just are. Mm. Um, so I think it's that ego that says this is what we need to be, you know, this is how successful we need to be, or, or you know, this is how much we need to work, and I think that runs through my life, and so I kind of try and express it as an anxiety. I think in my in my work is just that feeling of like, um, yeah, just feeling like you're never good enough, and that you you almost also feel like. <laughs> like I had this conversation the other day it's like it's not that you're um, on a train and complaining because it's not going fast enough it's that you, you couldn't even be bothered to get on the train because you knew it wasn't going to go fast enough so you'd rather just stay where you are and just watch the train go okay, you know, I can't even be bothered to get on that and I think mm. that's kind of that's the stuff that runs through my work is this feeling where it's like 
you almost lose the motivation to, to even try anymore. Not because you feel like you're owed something, but because you just feel like ultimately I'm probably not good enough. And then I think these characters disguise it as the guy does an Irish walk through this thing of like, well, you know, what is success? And I, you know, I know that mm. if I got there, I wouldn't be happy anyway. But I think really it's just a self loathing thing of, you know, I don't feel like I deserve anything. You know? mm. And then how do I, how do I operate, you know, within that? Yeah, that's yeah. wild. I mean, yeah, that's kind of like that's a that's a big rabbit hole there, isn't it? That that yeah. kind of yeah. it's like where is where is the success? You know, what is somebody's definition of success? But where does that where does that success turn into achievement? Because I, mm -hmm. I feel like I, like to touch on your point there of I feel like it's okay to to kind of achieve something and feel the success and then move on immediately to the next thing. You know, I, feel like that's, I feel like that's okay. I don't feel like I it's kind of something healthy. that, yeah, I think it is healthy. I do think it is healthy, you know, rather than kind of like, Hey, remember when I did that thing? Hey, Hey, yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, I'm obviously keen, you know, kind of, uh, acutely aware of that. You, you have to go, uh, yeah. right. You have to, cause my timer went off and your timer went off. Um, <laughs> There's there's a few more questions I obviously have for you, um, but you know we can do that in like a, a part two as it were or part three four five six. Um, but uh, is there anything at the end of this? Is there anything um, you know kind of uh, advice on creation? Um, my kind of audience, it's it's kind of mainly about uh, building confidence in your performance. Building confidence in yourself, using the creative process to get there, but also to not be so like hard on yourself. Uh, yeah. At the end of this part one interview, as it were, do you have any kind of advice for our, our listeners? I think um, what helps me is to remind myself why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I think it's you know, in a sense of what, what is it about this thing do I enjoy? Why is it that I want to write? Um, and that goes, so, you know, why do I want to act? And I think when I was young, a lot of the power was put in the other, you know, the person that I'm trying to impress or, you know, the money I'm trying to get to make a film or the award I'm submitting to. And as you said, those things are important in their way, but I think you just do those things and let go of it. You know, you send an application, you forget about it. You, you audition, you forget about it. But I think within yourself, you hold on to this fact that you know, you're doing it for a reason within you. Mm. And that's all that's important. And for me, success is doing it. I think the only failure is nice. if you stop what you're doing. You know, if, nice. if I said, oh, I'm not going to stop yet, then that's failure. But if I carry on, it, you know, how can you fail? But it's yeah, true, I just think right? that you can't you can't lose if you don't quit. No, exactly. You don't say <laughs> if we were outside smashing rocks and we, you know, oh, he's he's failed because he died. You know? But um, yeah, I think in in that sense, I think the second part that it, it makes me think is there's two things that I tell myself. I think one is that someone has to do it. So as good as anyone is that already exists, someone has to be the next thing. Mm -hmm. So someone, and it comes back to what you were saying about almost not being selfish with your, your point of view, you know, that it's unique and it, it needs to exist. And someone has to make films, someone has to act. Mm -hmm. So I always think, so why shouldn't it be me? Yeah, right. Um, and I think the other thing that I just think is that it's, you know, you've got to separate I think creatively join uh, join your life creatively like what you create should reflect your life and your own personal view but there has to be this boundary between um, you know oh I didn't get this job this acting job so now my whole life's miserable no you know I didn't get this acting job it sucked barrier <laughs> and now I go back to life you know whatever that is you know yeah, go and, go and get another job. Go 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 yeah, get exactly. out there. Yeah, don't don't let the don't let the losses build up. 
No, and don't let it kind of take over your life and consume it because it's, it's, you know, as important as creativity is and feeling like we need to kind of have a goal in life and to produce something that's important, it, it isn't all of life, you know. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think of Beckett's Crap's last tape, you know, where it's like regretting his life because he spent it all on the creative and none of actual life, you know. Yeah, right. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so before we go, final thing, um, where can, where can people find you? Can, can, can they find you anywhere? You, you active on kind of social media outlets? I'm not, no, but on, um, on my website, there's a, there's a contact form on my website. So that's probably the easiest way. And I always respond to emails. Fantastic, so, Nathan. Awesome. So we'll obviously put that in the description for you guys out there. Nathan Hughesberry, you've been fantastic with us today. Um, we, we would love to have you back on because there's, there's loads of questions that I didn't get to ask, uh, including why are trains always in your work, dude? You mentioned trains again today. <laughs> <laughs> trains feature i don't think even you're aware of this or are you trains, <laughs> trains feature in a lot of your work i challenge I you to go back and check else about a train, it's yeah. funny. Like, i reckon it's in about 80 percent of your work it's a lot <laughs> it is a lot it's either the mention of it, and even if you think, right, even if you think that, oh, no, I don't know what Jason, I don't know what Jason's talking about here, because actually, trains don't feature in that one or that one. Actually, there'll be some sound effect, you know, well, a, a train going overhead on a bridge. I'm yeah. sorry. I was just like, really? The trains again? So I'd love, to, I'd love to pick your brain about why trains feature so much, but obviously I'm, I'm aware that you're, you're pushed for time. No, but I'll think about that. We'll do it next time. Yeah. Awesome. And do you have any? Um, do you have any books to recommend? You mentioned you've mentioned Beckett today. Oh, you've been reading a lot of Beckett? Question mark. A lot of Beckett. Um, a lot of Karlov, Knausgaard, My struggle. He wrote. It's all just about his kind of life. Um, haven't read that. I haven't read that. You'd like that, yeah. It's, okay. It's very like, just very real. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I have so many books. So many books. Fantastic. I'll, have to, I'll, I'll get a list together. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Cool. Ciao for now, sir. Bye. Wow. So raw, so honest from Nathan Hughesberry today. Some real insights there into the creative process, I think. I took loads of gems from that. Cha-ching! And uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure that you guys did too. So you can go find him on nathanhughesberry.com so that is n-a-t-h-a-n-h-u-g-h-e-s-b-e-r-r-y.com um go over there as he said he, he likes messages Yay! you can see a lot of links off his website to various avenues to see his creative catalog and uh, yeah show him some love Aww. let him know that you've uh, you've heard what he had to say um and yeah let me know in the uh, in the comments and fire me a uh, a message you can do so via the anchor app or the anchor uh, website you just go to uh, anchor.fm forward slash confident performance and if you go to that link you can leave me a voice message um give me some feedback on how you think this first episode went and uh, you may even, as a special treat, Yay! be featured on the next episode. Um, obviously, these are all going out in a three, so you probably won't. But um, yeah, let me know what you thought of it. Give us some feedback. And uh, if you've got any questions for Nathan, do let me know. You can do that by reaching out to me on my socials. So my Twitter is JC Wilkinson. So at JC Wilkinson, that is J-A-S-E-Y Wilkinson. And uh, my Instagram, Jason Wilkinson 2020. And uh, then you can search for Confident Performance uh, via that. Reach out to me, hit me up. All right, much love. See you in the next episode. Bye-bye. See ya.